symposium, and, and one of the things I'm really going to do is try to say, well, here's how you can be a more effective communicator, and why would I want to stress that? Because this stuff is super important. It's really important that we, and especially the, the students here, learn to give effective talks that can inspire not just a, a bunch of scientists that are already interested in science, but lay people, politicians, and the rest of the public that hasn't come that hundred miles to see the ocean, that this stuff is worth saving. And what you see on the screen now is some video from uh, Sir Ridge, which is about 30 miles. I, I'm lost, I don't know where the ocean is. I think it's that way, maybe it's, where's the ocean? Somewhere around here. Anyway, this is just off our coast here. It's some beautiful deep sea coral communities and deep sea sponges, and I'll talk a little bit about those. But one of the things I want to do today is to stress kind of how do you, how do you communicate the excitement of natural history? And there's a couple things that we were asked to do. One of them is, is natural history of value? And I'll get into that just a little bit as well. And I better click the slide here so I get moving on this talk. Um, so is, what is natural history really? And I'm not going to go into what it is as much as it's the consequence of all the ecosystem processes that are driving uh, where something recruits, where larvae are distributed, how well something grows, how likely they are to compete or be eaten by something else. And I, I sort of think of every landscape, no matter where it is, as a probability distribution for the occurrence of some organism. And if you add up either in space or in time, what's the likelihood that that larva landed there or that animal was able to thrive and reproduce in that location like these goiter sponges, which are these beautiful organisms that can get to six or eight feet high and probably live thousands and thousands of years. We see on Sir Ridge or at Davidson Seamount these skeletons of these goiter sponges that have manganese crust on them. These are hexactinellic glass sponges and their skeletons literally last for hundreds, maybe tens to even hundreds of thousands of years. Hard to know. Um, but to get back to this probability distribution, every landscape is just basically the sum of all the likelihoods of the occurrence of animals from a pool of species that may live there. And that abundance of that standing stock we see is really the consequence of all those processes. And, and is natural history important? Sure it is. It's the stepping point off to try and understand how the system is functioning. Now, uh, my title of kind of my odd title focuses on this idea that is are we kind of moving away from what natural history is and is natural history natural well the, the top right photograph up there is, is from a book called the earth is faster now and that book was published at the beginning of this century and it was based on a bunch of interviews with um, Alaska natives and Inuit um, tribes that are Inuit natives that um, wanted to know I, I noticed some saying um a lot. I must be really nervous up here. This, this is typical. Um, go <laughs> so the, I'm trying to make a point. What's my point with this photo? That one of the things that one of the people that were interviewed said was, gosh, the earth is a lot faster now. And what that meant was that we can't tell, we can't predict the weather anymore because it happens so quickly. It changes so rapidly. And I've shown on the bottom here from Wikipedia this great graph of earth temperature. And it, goes from millions of years to tens of thousands of years to thousands of years. And the point is that Earth temperature is bouncing all over the place. But right at the end there on the very right side, you can see where it's bouncing up now with climate change. And Earth temperature and all kinds of environmental changes on Earth are happening faster now than they have probably happened more than a couple times over many hundreds of millions of years. This is a huge, huge change. Not necessarily in the magnitude of change, but certainly combined magnitude and speed. Even coming out of the last glacial period, say from 18,000 to 12,000 years ago, where we came up about 10 degrees Fahrenheit, it took 6,000 years to do that. We're going to do that in basically a very quick amount of time. Now, what does that mean for natural history? Uh, you know, the changes are so fast, are we sort of overcoming the sort of no normal pace or, or tempo of a lot of the evolutionary relationships among organisms, co-evolutionary relationships that are now disrupted because we've thrown green crabs in or a host of other invertebrates or vertebrates that are non-native to the location. And are we, is the idea that we can have stable communities sort of out the window now? And now what we're tracking is this more rapidly moving trajectory of natural communities as they're responding to a variety of the things that we do to them. 
And so is it, is it sort of worthless to even talk about natural history anymore because it's no longer natural? And I, I would say that absolutely not. It doesn't, I mean, it's unfortunate that we are perturbing many of our ecosystems so much that they are becoming in many ways non-natural or unnatural. But uh, I'd still say that when you throw together the mix and if you want to be Gleasonian about it, it doesn't matter what species are there, they're going to compete with one another and there's going to be function that we need to understand and be able to pre predict and we need to be able to communicate that. And I'm not doing a very good job of communicating, so I'm going to move on and talk talking about that because it's essential that all of you learn how to do this much faster and much further than I've been able to do it. I think of learning how to give a good talk as climbing a mountain and I've been doing that since the beginning of my uh, graduate career and I'm still only on the foothills of this large mountain and if you'd like to hear some really good stories about how to give a really bad talk go to the attitude adjustment hour and ask somebody about Jim Barry's catastrophes <laughs> up on the stage because there are several um, so how do you do this well I would um, Jenny mentioned compass and I would definitely get in touch with Compass Online or think about this thing called the message box so that when you do start to learn how to speak more effectively, you start to entrain this idea of, of sort of knowing what the issue is, what the problem is, what the potential solutions are and the benefits and, and who cares? Well, the who cares of this talk is it's important for us, especially in what we see as this interesting and accelerating political climate, um, we have to be even more diligent than ever at making sure that we communicate how important natural history is and how important it is for, under, for us to understand the natural world and where we fit into it. So, learn how to communicate. And how do we do that? Well, make sure that when you give a talk, why do we care about it? And, and I use a slide like this one that says there's all kinds of things that the ocean provides that we need or that we affect in many ways. And if you, I'm from Missouri, and if you talk to many of my cousins, and there are lots of them in Missouri. They're all really good Catholic families with um, lots of kids. <laughs> um, they don't really care about the ocean, but they should. And it would be great to be able to have someone stand up in the Missouri legislature and say, I really think we've got to worry about the ocean because it affects my life in ways that I didn't really know about until somebody educated me. So make sure you get the why do we care message across because otherwise your, your audience is already asleep. Make sure you try to summarize the issue. What is the issue? Well, in this case, the world is changing. Fossil fuels are, are affecting us. And in this slide, I'm just talking about how it affects the ocean, whether it's warming, acidification, sea level rise. But try to have some decent graphics. And, and I'm, I'm not claiming mine are because I have trouble all the time with graphics. And people tell me it's too busy to take out so many words. Um, but get that message across. Define what the problem is. What are you talking about with this scientific graph that you want to get into later on? Well, how do animals cope with change? And you can summarize what's going on. I won't talk about it here, and I'm going to try to catch us up a little bit because that'll help me get off the stage and out of the limelight. Um, tell stories and try to relate things to personal experience rather than just showing some pie graph and saying, well, there are allocating energy towards three groups, low cost of living, growth, and reproduction. Put it in human terms. Energy budgets for animals are very much like our own economic budget. So I get a paycheck, I pay my rent, pay my taxes, and if I have something left over, it goes to my kids' education and toys and vacations. Well, for animals, it goes to growth and reproduction. And if you stress animals, what happens during environmental change. If that environmental change is stressful, that cost of living goes up. You're spending more on rent. So what happens? Well, for animals, it means you can't grow as much. You can't reproduce as much, just like I don't get to buy that cool new uh, uh, camera or whatever it is I want. And you can talk about all the consequences of that or the details of that if you want. But make sure you get that concept across in a way that the, the audience, and I'm not talking about a scientific audience, I'm talking about lay audiences. If you want to communicate natural history or the things that affect natural history, then you've got to be clear. Um, don't do this. Don't show some Davenport diagram that talks about acid base regulation and the upregulation of bicarbonate and the metabolic uh, um, depression or whatever goes along with it. 
unless you're talking to a physiology audience. This is great for physiology, but don't do this to a legislator. They'll throw you out. Um, so then instead, tell some stories. So here we have a, sort of a complex graph. There's a graph on the right that shows the Pacific pH data from Ocean Data View. It's in that envelope around it. It's basically, here's the, the pH world of the, of the Pacific. Well, what's happening in the future? Basically, we're going to slide that pH envelope about 0.4 units to the left, and that's around 3,000 petagrams of carbon if you want to calculate it. But what it shows is if you want to describe what the world is going to be like in the future, the upper ocean, say the upper, five, uh, the upper thousand meters, and this goes from zero to 6,000 meters deep, the upper thousand meters has a fair amount of overlap between today's pH and the future pH. But for deep sea organisms below about 1,500 meters, it's a completely foreign world in the future than what they're seeing now and what they've evolved in over at least the recent evolutionary history. So how do animals cope like this vampire squid that's swimming around? Well, you could say acid-based regulation is difficult, but another way to, to talk about it is just in human terms. Think about when you go out and run. When we go out and run a marathon, you build up a lot of lactate and you acidify your tissues. And we have all kinds of ways to cope with acid-based disruption like that. We breathe hard, we blow out a lot of CO2, and we actually spend a lot of energy literally pumping protons out of our cells so that we can restore the acid, the normal acid-based balance in our tissues. Well, these animals can do very much the same thing, but they have a harder time doing it because what we do is we breathe in oxygen and we load off that oxygen on our blood, on hemoglobin at a high pH location in our bodies, our lungs, and then we deliver it to our tissues. They're really aching for literally aching because we're running and we, it lets go of that oxygen in our tissues. You can explain in human terms what happens to the physiology of this animal, which is now immersed in a more acidic ocean and cannot load oxygen as well as it used to be because, of, and I'm telling a terrible story now, but that point is learn how to do that in a way much more effective than the way I'm doing it right now. Um, likewise, you can talk about calcification problems or whatever the issue is for deep sea corals like this beautiful bamboo coral. Um, often it's, it's important, and Jenny mentioned that it's really important to, to look in your backyard. Make sure that when you're talking to an audience, where are you? you know, tell them, here's where we are. We're, we're located somewhere. I don't have to go into details, but there's Sir Ridge where this video was taken. Um, related also to human experience, if you can, if you're looking at deep sea corals, it's just a deep sea coral. It's a big animal to, to a lay audience. But if, when you fly over these and you start thinking about the time scales required for these communities to develop, they're incredibly old. Alan Andrews with, worked with us on Davidson Seamount and aged some of the little corals that had a diameter of just about a half an inch. And they were 250 years old. This coral you see in this photo is about two and a half to three meters high. And it's at least 1,500 years old, at least. But the, uh, I think the oldest date record is around 6,600 years for a coral. They're very much like the old growth forests that we see on the right here. Um, finally, uh, what's the problem? Make sure that you define what's going on. And I talk about energy flow because we depend upon energy flow so much to support the things that we want from the ocean, fisheries, beautiful animals, etc. And you can talk about how they may be threatened by something like ocean acidification and marine terapod shield here are known to be important in salmon prey. And what happens if you knock out those salmon, well, you, you might have an ecologically equivalent small zooplankton like krill that might be able to take its place. But in its very stressful environment, if we change the world enough, we may actually lose the food web. We may lose those key linkages in food webs that eventually lead to something other than what we want. Microbial slime always wins. Um, so, and then finally, your story should have an ending you should be able to say, what's the solution here? I can't just say, here's the problem, here's the issue, and good luck. You've got to provide some, some 